So AI doesn't exist, actually. Apparently we've all just decided to call it that. That's kind of annoying. I understand how this happened. There's an area of research in computer science called artificial intelligence. And under that umbrella is like your machine learning, your neural networks, and your deep learning. And so when people make tools using those concepts, they call it artificial intelligence. But that's confusing for, for the people because if you put in a headline, like AI is a thing that you have to worry about now, people actually think AI exists, even, even though it doesn't. So this video is not gonna be a discussion on AI or how to use it or how to make your own machine learning program. I'm not a computer scientist actually. I got my PhD in physics and I specialized in astrophysics and machine learning is really big in astrophysics and I am going to use artificial intelligence and AI and machine learning interchangeably in this video. Well, I have taken the courses and I've done those little workshops and I work with AI and machine learning tools at my job. I'm not a computer scientist. That's, that's not what this is. In fact, I'm only going to give the explain like I'm five definition of an AI, a machine learning tool. All right. Imagine you have 100,000 pictures. And they're of all the things, like buildings and vehicles and nature and animals. And you want all the pictures of cats. You can't look through 100,000 pictures. That would take way too long. So what you're going to do is you're going to write a computer algorithm that will sort through the pictures for you. And so when you ask it for cats, it gives you all the pictures of cats. Great. How do you do that? First, you get a subset of pictures, maybe like 400 pictures. And inside that subset, there are 15 pictures of cats and you label them all cat, not a cat. Okay. And then you give that data set, that smaller data set to the computer program. And you say, Hey, teach yourself how to recognize the correct answer. Look for patterns in the pictures of cats so that when I feed you this data set, you throw out all the pictures except for the pictures of cats. It's machine learning. You're not telling it how to identify cats. You're only telling it, these are cats, these are not cats. And the computer algorithm will teach itself to look for patterns and identify the cats. Great, you've done it. Now you wanna test it. So you have a second set of pictures. This time you know which are cats, but the computer's not gonna know which are cats. You feed it and you say, hey, use that machine learning tool you just made about cats on this data set. And if it gets all the cats, yay, you have a cat finding machine learning program. And so now you can give it all 100,000 pictures and it will find all the cats. We, we did it, but, but there's a problem. You see, that's a machine learning program. It's not a artificial intelligence. It, artificial intelligence doesn't exist actually. I can highlight this issue for you. You are a human person and you have intelligence, right? Here's a bunch of cats, pick all the cats. Okay, I assume you did something like this. Okay, if I gave that same exact test to the computer, it would give the same answer probably more quickly. But what if there was like a little stuffed cat? You see it and you didn't click it. I wanted you to click it. That's a cat, right? It's a stuffed cat, but it's a cat. If I'm talking to a person, I could say, hey bud, you didn't click that stuffed cat. And you would say, oh, I thought you just wanted the animal. Do you want me to click stuffed cats? And I would say, yeah, like all cats. So if there's like a Yeti bottle with a cat sticker or someone's got a cat tattoo or you see a little statue of a, of a little cat, click all those too. And because you're, you're a person with intelligence, you would say, got it, great. But what if I wanted to tell the computer, like, hey, I want you to do stuffed cats too, all cats, everything that even resembles a cat a little bit. I want you to find that and call it a cat. I can't actually do that. I can't say, hey, machine learning tool, you missed this one. Why didn't you call this a cat? I don't know how it decided what was cats. There are computer scientists who will be angry at me for saying this, but this is a black box program. I fed it a bunch of images. It learned how to identify cats somehow. I don't know how. It, it's, a, it's looking for patterns, it's, it's not intelligent, and it spits out the cats. And when I find an error, like, hey, this stuffed cat is a cat, I can't ask it to recognize this as a cat. What I have to do is get a new data set with tons of little pictures of cats 
and feed it back through and say, hey, also these are cats, okay? So when I do my test a second time and I give you these images, you're gonna say all these are cats and I'm gonna be like, great job, you're so smart, you did it, gold star. If I gave this to the computer, it would find all the animal cats because we already know it can do that. Now it's got the new data, I retrained it and it will find these cats, but it's also gonna call this a cat because when I fed it this picture, it was like, okay, long cylindrical glass thing, they're cats, this is a cat, right? And, and that's what I mean when I say it's not intelligent. I can't easily tell my machine learning program like, oh buddy, like you can see a cat. This is also a cat, right? The same way you would converse with a human. These programs are great. They're interesting, they're, they're useful, but they're not AI. And yet we're calling it that. <sighs> that seems like it'd be a problem for science communication, right? Um, but I, I wanna highlight some things that these are useful for. They're not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence doesn't exist actually. Well, what if you are an astronomer and you have 10 million pictures of galaxies and they're all different galaxies. What if you wanna answer a simple question about these 10 million galaxies? Like how many of these galaxies are elliptical and how many of them are disks and how many of them look very wonky? You could open every picture and sort it into a folder, but that would take way too long. You could hire some grad students that you underpay and force live in poverty and they could sort it, but that would be kind of mean because of the underpayment and also the fact that that would not be a very good PhD thesis and they probably wouldn't get a job after. You could make people do it. So you could start a program like the Galaxy Zoo, which is a cool little thing that you can go do right now and it will teach you how to identify galaxies based on images and it will let you sort them. And that's kind of fun. That's kind of fast and like you don't have to feel guilty about that because people are just having fun being citizen scientists. But it still takes a really long time. 100 million is a whole lot of galaxies. So instead, machine learning tools, right? Give it 10,000 galaxies that you've classified as elliptical or wonky or disk and teach it how to do that. And it will de develop a tool. It's, it's a machine learning. You're absent from this process. It develops a way to classify these images and then you test it. And if it gets all those right in the test data, you can run it on your 100,000 galaxies. Did I say 100,000, 100 million galaxies? And as long as you know the limitations of that tool, as long as you have someone who's an, an expert involved in the post-processing of that data, it is a very useful tool to use to analyze just an unfathomable amount of data. That's what machine learning is for. It is not intelligent. Notice I said you need an expert. You need an expert all along the way tracking this process. You can't just throw machine learning tools at the public and be like, you think it's AI, I guess that's fine, whatever. You couldn't do that. You wouldn't just do that, would you? I guess only if you charge like $29.99 a month or something. What if you're doing medical research? You, you give your machine learning program 100,000 images of like from MRIs of like people's lungs. And you're like, some of these have tuberculosis. Some of these don't. And what you can do is see if the computer gets better at diagnosing tuberculosis from an MRI than doctors are. And what do you know, they've done that and the computers are better. Great. So now if you're researching how symptoms of tuberculosis develop so you can start diagnosing it earlier, you can try to figure out the pattern that this machine learning program is finding. Like how exactly is it making this diagnosis? Now this is very hard. Remember, you can't ask the program, like why did you make this decision? And it gets even harder when you do your neural networks and your deep learning and all that stuff. It's hard to figure out like what exactly made you say this had tuberculosis. You can't ask through a lot of A-B testing, putting up two images that are almost identical. The doctors were able to figure out how the computer program was identifying tuberculosis more often than human doctors. And it turns out that the machine learning program was weighting the age of the machine that took the image. So if it was an older machine, it would say that it's more likely to be tuberculosis. And that's just by the virtue of the fact that older machines are at places where there's more tuberculosis. It's not intelligent actually. That's a useless piece of information, right? I mean, it's helpful if you are a medical doctor. If you're diagnosing someone, it is important to know if they have recently been to somewhere where there's tuberculosis, and then you would be more likely to test them for that. But if you are a researcher trying to look for early signs of tuberculosis, 
Like the age of the MRI machine is useless information to you. That's kind of funny, right? Cause like a human being would know to throw out that information because human beings are intelligent, but machine learning programs are not. Artificial intelligence doesn't exist. And so if you don't know the limitations of your tool and you start using it to just start diagnosing tuberculosis, it's just gonna say like, okay, everyone who's on a machine from 2009 has tuberculosis and everyone who gets an MRI on a 2023 machine doesn't. And that's not useful. That's not actually diagnosing anything. I hope I've highlighted two big misconceptions about AI for you. The first is that artificial intelligence exists. You know, it doesn't. The second is that we know how machine learning tools work. That's not true. We don't know how it gives us an answer. When we say, is this tuberculosis? We don't know how it got to the yes or no. We just know that it's saying yes or no. And when we give it a certain specific data set, it gets those right. You, you can use it as a tool, it can be very helpful, but it's very important for you to know its limitations. And because artificial intelligence doesn't exist, you shouldn't use it to make decisions, right? You, you shouldn't say, oh, this TB test works perfectly, fire all the doctors. You still need a human checking it because AI doesn't exist. In medical situations, you want a human person that has intelligence making the decisions. Imagine a group of nine-year-olds. What is that, like fourth grade? They're, they're gonna go to the library for some unsupervised learning. And the teacher, he says, hey kids, I want you all to write a two-page paper on a historical figure. So the hero of our story, Sophie, decides to write her paper on Pocahontas. And instead of spending her time researching this on the internet or going to find an encyclopedia or like one of those little golden books, she gets on her mom's chat GPT account, which costs like $59 a month. And she says, please write a two page paper on the historical figure Pocahontas in the style of a fourth grader. Now, chat GPT is a machine learning tool. The data it's been fed, it's basically the internet, okay? And what it will do is take samples of text from all over the internet, rearrange them, rewrite them, like thesaurusize them, thesaurathize them, and stuff them into a new paper that looks like a human wrote it. ChatGPT's goal is to make text that looks as if a human wrote it. ChatGPT's goal is not to make text that makes sense, actually, but like that's, that's for another day. So Sophie prints it out and it looks very much like a paper. And she's like, fantastic, I've done it. She goes home and she starts to feel bad because she's the hero of the story. And so she starts reading her paper and she's like, oh, because she notices that two paragraphs of this paper are about how she can speak to trees and her best friend is a little raccoon and she's the only human ever to learn all languages from the colors of the wind, blue corn moon, etc. This is a problem, right? She asked for a paper on the historical figure Pocahontas and ChatGPT was like, I looked on the internet for Pocahontas and I found the scripts of Pocahontas 1 and Pocahontas 2. So she could get back on ChatGPT, which costs like $100 a month for this garbage that it spits out. And she could say, please write me a two page paper on the historical figure Pocahontas in the style of a fourth grader. Do not include any information after 1991. When did Pocahontas come out, like 97? So she'd be, she could work around that and she would have to read it. She would have to go through it. She would have to spend a couple hours with ChatGPT getting it to print out something that looks like a fourth grader wrote it and also has factual information. Or she could take out her little tablet and she could just fact check every single line of text that ChatGPT had picked out and remove all the lies and replace it with information that is true. And that's another big misconception about AI right there. For some reason, people think because it's a computer, it cannot lie to you when with AI, there is no fidelity. It, it will just lie. It will make up information. The goal is not to be a fact checker or tell you the truth. The goal of ChatGPT is to write text as if a human wrote it. And even if it lies, it still is successful. It meets its goal. Think about Sophie again. She could have gone to the library and spent her two hours reading Wikipedia and writing a paper. 
but instead she tried to save time and just ask ChatGPT. If she had turned in that ChatGPT paper, she would have gotten an F. So instead, she had to fact check every single sentence, rewrite it, rearrange it, and she probably spent three hours total. ChatGPT is a tool. It can be useful, but it's not going to save you time unless you're an expert. What I think it could be useful for is if you're a scientist and you've written your whole grant proposal and you have the science portion done and you've got all your nice plots and you've got the funding portion done and you're just staring at the introduction like, I don't know what to write because the introduction is the hardest part. You could just get on ChatGPT and be like, what's the most interesting thing about lightning? Give me one paragraph on why lightning is important for science. And it would produce a paragraph. And because you're an expert, you could read that paragraph and immediately fact check it and just rearrange the text and add your own words. And then boom, you have a nice little introduction paragraph. You used it as inspiration. You used it as a tool. It did not write your paragraph for you because it would be garbage if it did that. Instead, you, you got ideas, you rewrote it, and it helped you solve a blank page problem. This brings me to an AI tool that I use all the time. It's a little app. You can download it on your phone and you take a picture of a plant and it uses an image matching tool to identify the plant for you. Based on what I've just told you about AI, about how artificial intelligence doesn't exist and also with AI, there's no fidelity. You don't know how good the information you're getting out is. Do you think I trust this app to actually give me the answer? No, of course not. I use it as a tool. I take a picture of the plant. It says it's this. I can go onto Google. I can go to a textbook. I can look at the plants and I can be like, is it actually this plant? It gives me a starting point to search. If I didn't have this, I would just be searching like pink leaf plant, you know, and that would take forever. That would be hard. It's a tool you can use to help get the actual information. If I was lost, and I had my phone for some reason and I was starving to death and I could take a picture of a mushroom, I still wouldn't eat the mushroom. And it says right when you open the app, like do not use this for foraging, do not trust the information that comes out of it. Would you eat the mushroom? Do you trust the little app? Like what if you take a picture from a different angle and it tells you it's a different mushroom? You don't eat the mushroom. <laughs> Let's put ourselves in, in like a one year in the future and there is now a Skin Doctor MD app and you download it and you take a picture, the mole that you're worried about and it's like, you're good. Don't go to the doctor, it's, it's probably fine. Do you trust the app? Do you trust the app after knowing that artificial intelligence doesn't exist? Uh, the app does not understand the gravity of the situation of, of skin cancer, right? If you go to a medical doctor, they're going to check it out. They're going to take it seriously. The app is just going to be like, yeah, it's probably fine. I don't know. <laughs> also, there's there's no fidelity. Have I mentioned that it'll just lie? Like if it takes a picture of a weird mole and it's never seen that type of mole before and it can't match it to anything, it's just going to be like, it's probably fine. I don't know. It's good. You're good. Are you going to trust the Skin Cancer MD app? Please say no. Please tell me you won't. This shouldn't exist. AI doesn't exist either. This actually brings me to another misconception about AI, which is that AI will take your job. AI can't take your job because artificial intelligence doesn't exist and there's no fidelity in the results from artificial intelligence. Like you always need a person to check the results. You always need an expert in whatever you're doing to check the results because you cannot trust the results of AI. So when people say, we're not gonna need to go to doctors anymore, you'll just stick your hand in the scanner and it'll measure your blood pressure. It's just like, no, it won't. You're still gonna have to go to the doctor because if, if you're, you have real intelligence like a human person and you're not gonna trust what the computer has to say because it doesn't have intelligence. It, I do wanna say though, it will take our jobs in the fact that like, there's a thing that's already happened where AI replaces jobs, but really they just fire expensive people and then hire them back as contractors. Let me give you an example. Like 15 years ago, when Google Translate started getting pretty good, people were like, hey, we can fire all our translators. We can just use this Google Translate program for $1,100 a month. And then they realized that AI doesn't exist and there's no fidelity and it would just output like garbage. Google Translate is pretty good for like a sign right? Or in an emergency situation, 
you can use Google Translate to communicate asthma attack. But if you're translating a novel, like a huge piece of text, wording is important, themes are important, and cultural context is important, you cannot trust Google Translate to do that. But people fired their translators, realized it made a garbage book, and then hired the translator back as like a copy editor. You're not translating the book, you're just fixing the shitty translation that the garbage app spit out. And so you used to be worth like a salary and benefits and now you're like $15 an hour. In the misconception that AI will take our jobs, it's true that terrible capitalists will fire lots of people and replace them and then realize that they made a mistake and then try to hire them back at a much lower salary, but they won't actually take the job because the expert will still have to come and do the job. You know what I mean? Oh my God, where are we at? Um, you should not trust AI to make decisions because AI does not exist. And also there's no fidelity in the results from AI. Humans make decisions. AI stuff can be used as a tool to offer data in that situation, but we should understand the limitations. Okay? Okay. <laughs> The third thing I want to talk about with misunderstandings of AI is along the lines of ethics. So AI tools are built with data sets that are made in the world. And the world is actually a terrible, terrible place full of inequalities and, and terribleness. The year is 2020, a medical student in the UK realizes that he's learning about all these infectious diseases and skin diseases and rashes and skin cancers. And all the pictures in the book are pictures of white people. And that's a problem because not all the people in the world are white. And so if you're a doctor and you're treating patients, you're not gonna have the knowledge to look at skin diseases and rashes and skin cancers and all those things on human bodies because you don't have all the information. So he made a little book called Mind the Gap and it's got pictures of very common skin diseases, rashes, skin cancers, all that stuff with people of all different skin tones because diseases appear differently based on your skin color. This was really prescient. Is that the word? I'm gonna go with it in 2020 because the government of the United Kingdom was like, hey guys, the hospitals are overwhelmed. If you're having trouble breathing for some reason, don't go to the hospital unless your lips are blue. And that's a problem because not all skin tones show blue lips when they lack oxygen. White people's turn blue, but not everybody's. So if you are giving that as a diagnostic to people with no medical training, people could die, right? Like you're sitting at home saying, I can't breathe, but my lips aren't blue yet and dying and that's terrible. And that was in 2020, so that's three years ago. Now, obviously the medical system, there's lots of problems there. Like it, there's inequalities there too, but if you are building an app that is looking for skin disorders, like the app we just invented, you are gonna input all the pictures you have of skin disorders. And apparently, since the invention of the camera, like a hundred years ago, and the year 2020, people have only took pictures of white people's skin disorders. Apparently, because that's how the medical students were learning it. So when you feed it all that data, it is going to be heavily weighted towards identifying things on white people and nobody else. So if you take a picture of your rash and you're a white person, maybe it would get it. Don't trust an app, just go to the doctor. I know that's hard to say when no one has healthcare, but just go to the doctor. But if you're, if you're not white and you take a picture, it's just gonna be like, doesn't look like anything to me. You're probably fine. I don't know what it is. And imagine that, but with like, every single machine learning tool. There's this misconception that computers cannot be biased. Like they're gonna make decisions with logic, decision trees, blah. But if you build computers on data that's biased, the resulting algorithm will be biased. I was going to bring up an example of a phone company that made a little app in like the past few years that would take a picture of a thing or a person or a building and categorize it in your little phone folder. 
and they tested it. It worked great. They released the phone to the public to buy in stores. And every single time that phone took a picture of a black person, it put it into a primate category. Now that's, that's offensive, right? There's like a whole history of racism with the phone doing that. And that's because the data that trained that algorithm was biased. They didn't give it enough pictures of black people. So when confronted with a black person, that the algorithm was just like, I don't know what to do with this picture. I don't know what this is. Does that mean that the person who coded that algorithm is a huge racist? I mean, it doesn't mean they're not a racist, but it does mean that their data set was lacking diversity. And so you can't use it. You can't use that algorithm because it, it doesn't have a data set that actually reflects the world. It reflects the inequalities in the world. And I told you I wanted to bring up that story. And when I Googled it, it's happened two times with two different companies and two different algorithms in the past few years, the exact same thing. It's <sighs> So I think sometimes people have this misconception that if something like that happens, it's because the programmer was racist and you could just open up the algorithm and there's a little loop that's like be extra racist and you can just like uncheck that box. But that's, that's not what this is. It's machine learning. You don't know how it's making the decision. It's a black box. All you know is the data put, that you put in. And if you put in the data of the world, it is going to be biased. Like the world is biased. Like imagine that you are giving a scholarship and so you, you want to like not have to look at the application. So you're like, tell you what, let's just take all the resumes of all the people who did, did really well in college and we'll train our algorithm on that. And then when we get the resumes from the people applying for the scholarship, we'll just have it pick who's gonna be the most successful. Well, who's the most successful in college? It's like rich women, right? Like. <laughs> The, the people who do the best in college are rich women, like women from wealthy backgrounds. And if you have a scholarship, isn't it gonna seem weird when all 25 reci recipients are like Ashley's and then 10 years later, Sophia's and then 10 years later, God, what's the name now, Oakley's and they all look the same and they all went to the same high school. Like it's because your, your program is biased. It reflects the world but it doesn't reflect like what should actually happen, which should be like an equal distribution of scholarships. So what you could do is you could be like, uh-oh, <laughs> the machine learning algorithm is just picking women. Oh no. So you could take off gender off the resumes, you could take off the name, but, but it's a black box, right? So like the next year when all the people still look the same, you're gonna have to spend a whole bunch of time A-B testing only to realize that, oh, it's looking for the same zip code and it's looking for people who were cheerleaders because most cheerleaders are women and women tend to do better in college. And it's like every single step, you have to check for biases in your data, but you can't do that because if you're giving it real world data, it is biased. Imagine asking a machine learning program what a president looks like. There's, there's actually already a thing where people who give mortgages are not allowed to use these tools. Like you, they have to have a human check the application because even if you remove like the names and the birthplaces, the algorithm still figures out who is black. And because there's this huge history of denying mortgages to black people, historically, historic data means that those algorithms are biased towards giving mortgages to black people. And so they figure it out because it's a machine learning program and they deny people who could totally pay the mortgage and should totally be given the mortgage and they have to have a human person check. <sighs> it's, it's a problem. Yeah, it's a problem. AI doesn't exist. There's, there's, n there's no decision-making process. It's just identifying patterns, which means you should not use it to make decisions but also they just spit out lies. AI does not tell the truth. There's no fidelity, which means you should not use it to make decisions. AI is built on data sets that are biased. As a result, the decisions made by AI are biased. Therefore, it is unethical to use AI to make decisions. You need an expert 
checking the decision. It is a tool you can use, but it should not be used by itself. I have a second bullet point in this ethics of data science thing that's less important, but still we should talk about. Ethically, you should not use AI to produce products because AI is trained on stolen data. Like chat GPT is fed the internet. It is fed books and music and code software that is built by humans who, who did things like art that is made by artists. And it takes all those things and smushes them together to make garbage. And if you were to take that garbage and, you know, make a YouTube video and say, this is my special fancy video where I did Game of Thrones, but the story is Dracula and the art is Spongebob. You, you didn't make any of that, right? You stole all of that from the makers of Spongebob and the author of Game of Thrones and the author of Dracula. Like that doesn't belong to you. And it, it is unethical for you to present it as if you made something because you did not make anything. And it is legally a problem when you try to profit off the works of other people. Lots of lawsuits popping up about this now, by the way, so I'm, I'm not the first to think of this. But ethically, it's a problem for you to be like, I wrote a song when really you were just asking ChatGPT to be like, write a song like Prince would write a song. Because you didn't write that. Prince wrote a bunch of songs. A computer program smushed them together to produce something that looks like a song but is garbage. And now you're saying you wrote a song. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> ethically, you should not use this to make stuff. You can use it as a tool to get ideas. But legally, that stuff doesn't belong to you. Like, you can build off it. You can write your own. Like, <laughs> like often, people will write fan fiction. Like, I really like Batman, and I've written a Batman fan fiction universe novel. And then they take that, and they chew on it a bit, and they, they, they change around the story, and the characters get minds of their own, and they can just change the names, and now it's a thing that they made, right? They, they worked off of something else, but then they made something that's their own. If you just ask ChatGPT to write Batman fan fiction, but the main character, the main love interest is Angela Collier, that's not a thing that I made. That's just stolen from Batman. And it's, it's going to be garbage because someone's going to have to go through and rewrite it and change everything because it's garbage. It's not ethical to use AI tools to make decisions, to make products. My final bullet point in my little ethics category, which I'm going to make a smaller text because it's like not as important as like the diversity, the inequality issue, but, but it's unethical for you to use AI tools to make shitty AI art and force me to look at it. I don't want to see this lame shit. This is garbage. You can't get on some image generator and be like, do Star Trek TNG, but as the Muppets, and then make a bunch of shirts and pretend that you made art. What you did was write a prompt, and then what the AI did was make some garbage that I don't want to look at. It is unethical for me to have to see this shit everywhere. I hate it. How can you do this to me? All you've done is write a tweet circa 2006 and you've stolen some art from a bunch of people who worked very hard on it and now you're like money please i did a thing i did an art i did an art oh my god guys money please i'm in a lot of youtube forums because my sound is bad and my video is bad and there's like reflections on my glasses and i don't know how to fix that um the, the youtube forums are not helpful because they are inundated with these people who are like i'm gonna use an AI text generator to write scary stories, and then I'm gonna use an AI sound 
editor to make an AI voice to read the stories. And then I'm gonna use an AI image generator to make scary pictures to match the stories. And then I'm gonna make a YouTube channel and I'm gonna be like Mr. Beast and I'm gonna get $10 million a year because I made something. And it's like, no, you made nothing. You made garbage. No one wants to watch that. No one wants to look at AI generated art while listening to an AI voice read a dumb, terrible piece of shit story that's completely unedited. I mean, no one wants that. No one wants, I'm mad that you made me read that that is your idea. No, you didn't make anything. It, that's garbage. It's just, it's trash. There's a thing that comes up when new tools and new technology gets invented where the AI people who make art really like to talk about this, where they say, you know, when photography first came out, people thought that wasn't art either. So when I get on chat GPT and I tell it that I want the story of the matrix, but written in feudal Japan, and then I try to make that a book, that's art. They don't understand. That's art. I spend hours writing prompts. <laughs> they say that. They say like, no, you can't just write a prompt. It's you have to write a prompt. Like you have to, I, I put my soul into my prompts. I'm like Phineas and Ferb, pink background, film noir, banana. I did that, that came from my soul. That's art. And I just, I don't like this argument because it, it's not art. I think it's more like fashion actually. Like fashion is art and it has been for hundreds of years and people play with color and silhouette and texture and they make gorgeous things. And now people make like shows and their art is the clothes, but there's there's music and there's backgrounds and there's dance and it, it's art, right? But also like people just make fashion in their homes and that's also art. Have you seen this adorable boy make Hawaiian shirts for his father? Art, artist, right? But not all fashion is art. Some fashion is literal garbage, like, like Shein. Shein just like washes the red carpet, they steal the idea, they make a shitty knockoff, and they sell it, and it gets shipped across the seas, and people open it, and they're like, ew, this smells bad, and it feels gross, and the tag says, oh God, help me, please, and they throw it in the trash. Like, that's what, AI generated art is. It, it's garbage. It's, it's trash. I don't want to have to look at it. I'm mad that you're making me look at it. It's Pixar, right? They, they use machine learning tools, right? They use it as a tool in their art, which they make art. I mean, this one wasn't very good, was it? But it's art. They made a thing. They used machine learning to, to, to make an animation, um, but they still had animators. They still had experts working on it. The AI did not make the decisions. The artists made the decisions. You're letting the AI do all the work and what do you know? It gives garbage and you're trying to make me look at it. I don't want to look at it. We all know these people, right? Like these people who like fell for crypto or they fell for an MLM and like a year and a half ago, they texted you a picture of the NFT wallet. They were like, don't send this screenshot around it'll lower the value. <laughs> or like your relative who owns and drives a Tesla. I don't know what time you're watching this, but in my time, about a week ago, a billionaire built his own submarine against all logical advice and took a bunch of other really rich people down to the Titanic with him and it exploded and they all died. And the internet had this conversation of like, is it okay to laugh at the deaths of billionaires at their own hubris, like an Icarus situation? Is it okay to laugh at that? And I think we all decided like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. But <sighs> people drive Teslas, you know, it, it's not the same, but it's, it's not not the same.
blast was felt for miles in Cape Canaveral. Anyway, I don't want to I don't want to be mean to these people that keep falling for these things. Like I think we live in a world where it's very hard to be alive and we all need money and when you see a get rich quick scheme, sometimes you fall for it. Sometimes you get scammed. And it's it's not it's not their fault, but like we got to watch out for those people we know cuz like they're just the machine learning scams are coming for them. They're coming for them. We can see it closing down on them and you know now you know you can say the things to them and but it's not gonna work this is what i mean when i say that ai doesn't exist but it's gonna ruin everything like i'm in my 30s man i've lived through crypto i've lived through nfts i have lived through the mlm boss babe instagram babe boss babe and i'm tired i can't do it again i don't want to see the ai tools version of all of this. I don't want to get emails from women I have not spoken to in 17 years that say like, hey hun, just working on my machine learning course for $5,700. You can get two hours with me and I'll show you how to use AI optimization SEO tools, babe, boss babe, babe. I don't want to see it, but we're going to have to see it. We're going to have to see it. And it's not just in like scammers and grifters. Like you're gonna go to Thanksgiving and that one cousin who, bless his heart, he's so interested in science, but he doesn't understand that headlines are not science. And he's just gonna be like, hey, I just saw that chat GPT made, a, made an equation for time travel. Oh my gosh. And like, you have, to, you have to be half a drink in and decide like, do you wanna tell him that that's not how equations work and that's not how chat GPT works and you know, AI doesn't exist, there's no fidelity, and it's unethical to make any decisions based on them because of the, the data sets are biased. Are you gonna tell them that? Are you just gonna have another drink and be like, yeah, cool bud. I've been getting some version of this comment on YouTube for a while now. And I don't wanna, I'm not gonna post the real ones because it it's such an embarrassing thing to say. It's it just shows such a lack of understanding of what AI tools are. AI tools, they don't make new things. They sort information and then they smush it back together and they can be useful in like research, like large data sets or like as an accessibility tool. Have I even talked about that? Like if you're a person who needs subtitles, everything's coming up millhouse for you, right? Like. Subtitles are getting better and better. Machine learning tools are very, very useful as tools, you know, but a machine learning tool, a chat GPT, will never write a physics paper that advances the knowledge of physics in any way. That's, that's not how they work. You could get on chat GPT and you could pay your $196 per month and you could say, please write a physical review letters paper about dark matter. And it would do that. It would do that for you. It would look exactly like it was written in LaTeX and it might even cite actual papers, but it will also cite papers that don't exist. And it will also have nonsense plots and nonsense equations all smushed together. And if you're a non-expert, you might look at it and be like, oh, wow, it did the thing, it did the thing. But if you have taken a high school physics course, you will look at it for two seconds and be like, this is nonsense. This is garbage shaped like a physical review letters paper. This is an embarrassing thing to type. And it just points to how little journalists care. AI doesn't exist. And that's what we're calling it. That's what we're gonna call it. And we're just gonna have to deal with this for the next 15 years. I don't wanna do it. And don't think for a second that it's just gonna be like, grifters and scammers and like that person who really loves science and wants AI to exist so they keep talking about it. It's gonna be like an idiot that looks like one of these guys and they're gonna go to a boardroom full of other idiots. I'm 21 years old and my dad bought me a spot at Princeton and I dropped out and for some reason that makes you think I'm smart. For some reason dropping out is seen as an achievement instead of like just changing your mind or something. And I've invented an AI tool and now you can fire 4,000 people at your company. And because, 
capitalism. They're like, oh, third quarter is going to be real great if we fire 4,000 people and you and I are going to have to deal with it. Like an airline is just going to fire 4,000 customer service people and all the flights are canceled and no one ever uses that airline again and like the taxpayers are going to have to bail them out, but they're never going to hire 4,000 people back. So forever, we're just going to have to deal with worse customer service. It's just going to be harder to fly in a freaking plane, harder than it is because AI tools, I invented an AI tool. I'm, eh. I hate this for us. I really do. So, AI doesn't exist, but it's not going away and it's gonna ruin everything. I've made some predictions. Um, I thought I would start with things I would have predicted but have already happened because I'm too late making this video. The, the first is that, you know, a lawyer uses ChatGPT to write a legal brief and then gets in big, big trouble. That already happened. There's legal legal about it. It wasn't even the lawyer, like just another lawyer at the firm used ChatGPT. The lawyer on the case signed it, even though ChatGPT made up cases. You know, there is no fidelity, AI doesn't exist. And he gave it to the judge and the judge was like, explain this to me, you know. Another thing I would have predicted is that some sort of therapy robot gets introduced so you can fire all your therapists. Cause like, who needs human connection when they're getting therapy? You know, that doesn't seem important. So an eating disorder hotline fired all the people who worked there, replaced it with a robot, and the robot quickly learned how to teach these young children, these boys and girls with eating disorders, how to be better at having an eating disorder. Who, who would have thought that that would happen? It's almost like there's no fidelity in artificial intelligence. It's almost like it's unethical to use artificial intelligence to make decisions, to have conversations with people without an expert present. Who, who would have thought? Okay, I saw this one a while ago, but a professor used ChatGPT to put the exams into ChatGPT to see if the students had used ChatGPT. And ChatGPT was just like, yeah, all of them, they're all fake. And so he gave them all Fs and all the students were like, I can prove I didn't use ChatGPT. And the guy was like, who would have thought? Chat GPT lied to me. Oh my goodness, who could have predicted this? So this one's been happening for nearly 40 years. Like since the first computer program was designed to speak like a human, where people are easily convinced that it's a real human and it's alive. And this guy got fired from Google because he was like, I'm a whistleblower man, the AI is real. <laughs> It's like, I programmed you to say, I'm alive. And then when you said, I'm alive, I think it's alive. It said it's alive, guys. I'm shocked that this could have happened. I think it's really funny. Okay, so here are my predictions. I've already said the big one. Like some big company is gonna fire a bunch of people. The company is gonna go to shit. Taxpayers are gonna have to get them out. That's gonna happen. I don't know why I feel like it's gonna be airlines. I just feel like it's gonna be an airline. My next prediction is that somebody is going to die. That skin cancer app or something equivalent will come out. Someone will use it, trust what it says, and they will die and the family will sue the app. And the app will be like, this is just a toy. We told you it's not medical advice. I also predict the reverse will happen. Like some doctor's office or hospital will replace like a receptionist with an AI and someone who needs medical help will go and the AI receptionist will be like, you're fine and they can't get a person and then they'll die also and the family will sue that doctor's office. I think some small government organization, maybe a DMV replaces something with a chat bot, will fuck up like a rich person's day and that rich person will take it to the Supreme Court and I don't know what'll happen with that. They probably won't ban, a ban AIs, but they will ban them from interfering with rich people's lives. Like there'll just have to be an option that's like, if your bank account has this much money, you can talk to a person instead of the AI. I predict a school district will get sued. A school district will like replace whatever guidance counselor sorts the students into courses with an AI. And rather than looking at like what the students have taken the years before and what they requested for their schedules, the AI will sort them by like zip code. So like all the rich kids will go to AP Latin and all the poor kids will go to like gym and shop class. And obviously this will cause mass 
chaos and you know it's, it's unethical to use AI to make decisions because it's always going to be biased but like they don't know that yet they will when they get sued and they can't buy textbooks for like the next 15 years I predict every single consumer company will release a product that they already have that already exists but they'll just call it AI tools just like Gatorade now with AI tools your fridge now has AI tools to help you know when to buy milk. Your phone doesn't have Siri anymore. Now we call it AI tools, even though it's the same exact code and it's already AI tools. And people will buy them again. They'll be like, I love this AI. Gotta love AI, it's so great. Just like YouTube comes out and they're like, our algorithm's now with AI. And it's like, bro, it's the same algorithm. You already use a machine learning algorithm. What are you talking about? <laughs> My next prediction. AI is going to permanently fuck with someone's life. Like, Imagine AI determines who can get a bank account and some 21 year old woman is applying for a bank account and the computer is like, no, you can't have it because in 1974, someone with your exact name got a bank account and stole something or something or debt something something. And the young woman will be like, but I'm 21. I wasn't alive in 1974. That wasn't me. And the bank will be like, computer said no. So, and she'll have to like call her senator and her senator will be like, well, the, 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 the machine learning, it's, it's machine learning. What are we going to do? The bureaucracy. And like a Netflix documentary will have to be made. And once it's made, everyone's going to be like, have you seen this crazy story where this woman can't get a bank account? And like, she didn't do anything wrong. And then eventually something will happen. But we're all just going to be like, what are they going to The computer said no. What are we going to do? Okay, here's my prediction. So all the companies will replace all the people with AI tools, right? And as a result, companies will open, new new companies will form and they will, they will be like a subscription service where you can purchase an AI tool to talk to the other AI tools until you get a person. So like it'll just be robots talking to each other until something dings and you can finally talk to customer service. Has anyone invented this? Should I copyright this idea? Okay, my next prediction is that a giant company, like a TV studio or a movie studio, is gonna spend $800 million making a fully AI program, like the AI script with the AI characters and the AI editors, and it's gonna be like, well, it's gonna be, the, we, we, we fed it all the Marvel movies, and since Marvel movies make $400 billion, this one's gonna make $900 billion. Oh my God, God, it's gonna be crazy, and then no one's gonna watch it. Because no one wants to look at this shit. No one wants to see, this is soulless. This is garbage. Don't make me look at this. I'm not going to look at this. But they're going to do it. And they're going to release it. And the studio will blame Gen Z. They'll be like, Gen Z doesn't like movies anymore. They don't have the attention span to sit through a movie. And they'll learn nothing. All right. You're going to see dudes that look like this on Tinder. And they'll call their job prompt engineer. That's not my joke. I don't know where I saw it, but it's hilarious. I find it very funny. I predict we'll see lots and lots of think pieces about how AI is gonna change everything. Everyone's gonna lose their jobs. AI is gonna change everything. It's gonna be so fucking bleak. It's the Terminator situation. You don't need to worry about climate change because AI is gonna be the Terminator. This article definitely wasn't written by the granddaughter of the person who founded ExxonMobil. It's fine, don't look into it too much. You don't have to worry about the future. It's ruined by AI, not climate change or anything. There will be lots and lots of think pieces on how AI is gonna save everything. Don't worry about climate change. AI is gonna solve that. Don't worry about funding cancer research. AI is gonna solve it. Don't worry about it. Everything in the future is a utopia of beautifulness because AI is gonna solve it. And finally, I predict you will see lots and lots of think pieces how AI is going to ruin everything. Not in like a Terminator way, but in like a more bad way that's annoying. And that's actually the think piece you're in right now. Is it your first time? Was it good? Was it good for you? You can't get on some image generator and be like, 
do Star Trek TNG, but as the Muppets. So I said that as like a joke, but I unironically love the Muppets. If you ever get on Disney Plus and you're like, why would they make a Muppets Mayhem show for adults in the year 2023? Who is that for? It's me. I love the Muppets. I love Star Trek TNG and I can't just leave that on the table. So if you have $1,100 that you spend every month on ChatGPT and you could ask it to do that same prompt, let's compare our answers and see who's making the, the real Muppet art over here. I don't know. Okay, so obviously Picard has to be Kermit. Great. Um, I think there's lots of cute stuff you could do here because, you know, he's drinking Earl Grey tea hot. I think he would look adorable in the little uniform. I would love for his ready room to be scaled to Kermit size, like the bridge normal size, but the ready room scaled. So like when war for anybody goes in, they have to like duck down and it's like really uncomfortable for them in there. You have lots of room for jokes with like his little shelf with all his things. The Rassican flute would be like a banjo. You could have a picture of his French family's wine farm, but instead it's like a swamp and they make moonshine. That would be really fun. Okay, let's just go on the bridge. For Worf, I was kind of torn between Sam the Eagle and Bobo the Bear. Um, Bobo the Bear, he's, he's one of my favorite Muppets. He's very funny. He's like a very lovable big guy, but he's always on the bad team. He's always like an evil henchman. He's always a security guard, which makes him perfect for Worf, but he does, does it like a bad job. But Sam the Eagle, he's, he's very like, American and proud and and Worf is also very like Klingon and proud but also Federation and proud so I really I have to make Sam the Eagle Worf he'd be like it's the Federation way um Boba the Bear I'm gonna slam him into transport he's gonna be O'Brien and I think this would be really funny lots of rooms for jokes when he like messes up the transporter that would be very very fun um for Data I'm gonna do Beaker uh, cute, right? Um, it gives us the opportunity to have Noon Young Sung played by Bunsen, right? Cute. Um, and also you could have Lore, just like a little throwaway joke, played by Evil Beaker. Played by Evil Beaker. That's cute, right? Now, um, for La Forge, I'm thinking Gonzo. And Gonzo is really important when you're making a Muppet movie because Gonzo, he's often palling around with Rizzo the Rat, you know, and they're kind of the Rosencrantz and Guildstern characters. They're breaking the fourth wall. Like they know that they're in a Muppet movie. And so I feel like if you make LaForge Gonzo and you make Wesley Rizzo the Rat, you could have them palling around and engineering like on their own with hijinks and stuff, but you could also have them on the bridge making jokes. Um, also, just a fun throwaway joke I think you could have is like the hologram Gordy's in love with Leah Brahms. You could replace her with the hologram of a chicken. That that would be very funny. Um, this, um, me, <laughs> this means that Dr. Crusher, Wesley's mom, would of course be played by Rizzo the Rat's mom. And even in the medical bay, you could have like all 1200 of his brothers and sisters, like they're eating pizzas again, play with their size. They're really small, they're wearing cute little tiny uniforms and they're treating these giant alien patients. Very, very fun. Um, <sighs> this creates a problem for Miss Picky though, because while Picard does not really have a love interest, like at least on the bridge, um, Miss Piggy is Kermit's love interest. And if I was gonna pick anyone to be a love interest, it would be Dr. Crusher, but I don't wanna lose Rizzo the Rat as Wesley. So just, just follow me here. Um, sometimes Kermit and Piggy are in love and sometimes Kermit's chasing Piggy and sometimes Miss Piggy is chasing Kermit and he's not into it. So I think it would be very fun if the setting of our Muppet movie has Miss Piggy as Luxana Troy, okay? So Luxana Troy is Deanna's mom, De Deanna, Deanna's mom. And 
every time she shows up, she's like very sexual and sensual. And in a very specific episode I'm thinking of, which is Manhunt, which is the 19th episode of season two, she's doing a diplomatic mission where she's reading these, um, God, what are they called? There's a fish aliens, the Andorians. What a handsome race. She's, she's there to read their minds and stuff, whatever, they're all going to a conference or something. And she's also going through a Betazoid heat, so she's like very, like she's looking for a, So she goes through Picard and he's not interested and she, he goes, she goes to Riker and she goes to the holodeck and it's, it's very fun and it's very funny and I feel like it's very Miss Piggy. Like Miss Piggy would try to seduce Kermit and she didn't get her way, she would definitely move on to Riker. Um, so that's season two. A lot of people skip season two, or a lot of people skip seasons one and two of Star Trek TNG, but there's a lot of really good episodes. Manhunt is one of those episodes. It's very funny. It's very funny. It has a lot of jokes, which is what we need for a Muppet movie. Of course, in season two, Dr. Crusher would be replaced by Dr. Pulaski. You don't remember her, no one remembers her, so we're just gonna ignore her. We're gonna pretend Dr. Crusher was there. It's, it's fine. It's fine. So, in this episode, Luxana Troy is there, um, and so are the Antedians. And the joke of the episode is that she reads their mind, like at the very end, and she's like, you don't want to talk to them, they're suicide bombers. It's very, very funny. And I think we could replace these guys with another pair of my favorite Muppets, which is Waldorf and Statler. They could just, they'd be in the background, they'd be making jokes. It, it'd be very, very fun. Um, so now we're at a problem for De Deanna Troy. Right, um, because Luxana Troy is Deanna Troy's mom. And we have, of course, seen the daughters of Miss Piggy, you know, a Muppet Christmas Carol. We've seen them. Um, no, not into it. So I'm going to use Deanna Troy as my human character. And I'm thinking Stephanie Shu. Of course, she's great. She's hot, she's beautiful, she's great at acting. But I'm specifically thinking of everything, everywhere, all at once, where she's got like a lot of mom discussions and she's playing multiple different characters interacting with her mom. And I think she could really do a Deanna Troy being like loving her mom, but also being very annoyed and embarrassed at work with her mom. I think that would be great. Um, and that's perfect because Deanna Troy's love interest is Riker and I'm gonna cast another human for Riker and they will be our humans interacting with our Muppets. And I'm thinking Taylor Lautner, I don't know why, but he gives me Jonathan Frakes vibes. Like Jonathan Frakes, he, he's, he's very handsome and he's very like sexual, I think, as Riker. Does anyone else feel that? Am I telling too much about myself as a child watching TNG? But he's also like, he plays to the camera, not really the other actors, and I feel like Taylor Lautner is that kind of actor. And I think he would really get along with Stephanie Hsu. That'd be a great little, Lots of chemistry there. Um, and so for, for Guinan, okay, for Guinan, Guinan's one of my favorite characters. And honestly, I would just bring Whoopi Goldberg back. I, I have not watched Picard seasons one or two or the apparently totally different show season three. I'm not gonna watch it. I don't know. I mean, convince me to watch it in the comments, but I would rather just have Whoopi Goldberg back. But if she's not, I'm just gonna do Fozzie Bear because I like Fozzie Bear. I feel like he would be a good little bartender and it wouldn't be a Muppet movie without Fozzie Bear. I also think you would have Animal working behind the bar in 10 Forward just for like laughs and jokes. And Lieutenant Barclay would be this guy. All right. All right, bye.